Hello everybody, this is Tim once again here with my review for Jason Goes to Hell. Whip out my DVD here. Jason Goes to Hell. No, the final Friday on this one, but that uh, that little subtitle <laughs> was on the movie posters. But, uh, this is a cool cover. I like the metallic mask and the fire flames. Once again, the back for anybody that actually gives a fuck. Okay, this includes the unrated and R-rated versions. Why anyone want to watch the R-rated version? I don't know, but uh, Fangoria. This has the most incredible ending we've ever seen. Hmm, questionable. <laughs> Special features: uh, filmmakers commentary with the director Adam Marcus and screenwriter Dean Laurie. The commentary is fun on this. I like the commentary. This is my second favorite commentary of the films after the one from Part Five. Uh, TV version: alternate scenes, the jump to a death special feature, and the original theatrical trailer. This film is directed by Adam Marcus, um, stars John D. LeMay, Carrie Keegan, Aaron Gray, Allison Smith, Stephen Colt, and Stephen Williams. Okay, let's jump right into the film here. The score for the film by Harry Manfredini. I'm pretty sure it's Harry Manfredini. Let me make sure. Yes, it's Harry Manfredini. Now, the score is by Harry Manfredini. The score in this film, I think, is only alright. I don't really think it's anything amazing. I think it's only an alright score. John D. LeMay in the film, though, as the lead. He's all, he was also in the Friday 13th TV series, which I actually enjoyed the television series because even other than the title, uh, the, the actually uh, other than the you know the, the the title of the series being Friday the 13th, trying to act like it has something to do with the franchise when it doesn't. Uh, this I just thought the, the episodes were actually quite you know decent, better than the Freddy's Nightmare series, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, John DeLamay, I like. He has good charisma. I like him as like this kind of slightly nerdy guy, but uh, who's willing to like do anything he can to like save his daughter and the the girl he loves. So I really root for him. He's one of my favorite leads in the franchise. I really enjoy him. Uh, Carrie Keegan, uh, she's okay as Jessica. I mean, she's decent. There's nothing really wrong with her. But I'm a John DeLamay guy all the way. <laughs> Okay, let's jump right into the story of this film. It takes place uh, a couple, maybe a couple months after Jason Takes Manhattan. I'm not for sure. It doesn't specify. Okay, continuity-wise, this film, I'm a big stickler for continuity. Me, I am. So this film butt fucks continuity pretty hard here. It's a couple months after Jason Takes Manhattan. Okay, I get that. It's a while after. Jason is back at Camp Crystal Lake. He's got burns on him and stuff, I guess, from the toxic waste from the end of Part 8. So he's back at Crystal Lake with his regular body. Even though at the end of part 8 we saw him in a kid form, but uh, in his child form. But I guess that could have been like a hallucination or something by the character Rennie from the end of that film. So, it's a couple of months after part 8. You know, the question comes, you know, how the fuck did Jason come back after his death from the toxic waste at the end of part 8? Okay, decent question. No explanation whatsoever given. I mean, I would have I guess because the ending of part 8 is so confusing or was so confusing and it was so stupid that they just chose to just like kind of set the film a couple months afterwards that way they wouldn't have to deal with it they do the same thing with Freddy's Dead because of the ending of the dream child um but I would have liked some kind of explanation you know something in there like they could have just said that Jason's body wasn't wasn't found in the sewers something like that fuck I mean anything I would have liked just a reference to part 8 in some way shape or form but it breaks continuity is the first one that really breaks continuity the first 8 at least followed after each other this one breaks continuity and I don't like that at all but you got Jason back at Camp Crystal Lake you got a woman who goes there uh, she arrives at Camp Crystal Lake you get like a couple of the Friday 13th cliches and horror movie cliches here which is fun I like with the lights going out in the place and she what's funny is she goes to take a shower and she's like you're gonna take a shower she's an FBI agent really and spoilers she's an FBI agent and she's gonna try to like lure Jason out there into an ambush out in the woods how the fuck the FBI was able to set up an ambush in the woods without Jason knowing about it I don't know it's his woods I have no fucking idea how they accomplished that one but uh so she's like trying to lure Jason out by taking a shower stripping off naked I thought that was funny so Jason shows up and tries to hack her uh he misses she run, makes it out of the uh, cabin he follows her into the woods she leads him into a certain area she's like standing around in the woods she turns around and boom there's Jason Played once again by Kane Hodder. Kane Hodder, he's fine. Uh, so Jason gets ready to whack her with his machete. The mask in this is kind of like a metal-looking mask. It's kind of like superimposed into Jason's face, like stuff. The straps are like 
made like run into his face or like he knit his head's like real swollen looking. Kind of like a beehive looking head. <laughs> but I guess we're supposed to, once again, I guess we're supposed to think he got that way because of the toxic waste from the end of part eight. But anyway, so you just read a hacker. The FBI pops out. They blow Jason all to shit. They even fucking blow him up. He blows up his whole body like obliterates in a pretty cool explosion. This scene, I enjoy this scene. This was really cool. This whole thing was. It's like after everything Jason's been through in other films that hasn't killed him, let's bring something new. Let's blow him to fucking pieces. Use the FBI to do it. <laughs> that was cool. I enjoyed that. Then you got Stephen Williams in the film, and he's this bounty hunter. And you see like the close-up on Jason's heart, and then the screen cuts away, and it goes, uh, Jason goes to hell, and then a slash at the bottom, I believe, and it says like the final or the fire comes up or something like that, and you see like Final Friday or something like something similar to that. That's a cool title opening. I enjoy that. You got Stephen Williams in the film. He plays like this bounty hunter named Creighton Duke. He's a cool character. He's one of the best characters of the franchise. Um, but he uh, he knows everything there is to know about Jason. It's never explained how he knows all this. He even knows like what weapon you can kill Jason with, this magical dagger, which I believe is the same dagger from Evil Dead. Uh, how this dagger is able to kill Jason. It's never explained. You can only do it in the hands of a Voorhees. Why? It's never explained. <laughs> But, uh, in this film, you find out, like, this film doesn't feel like a Friday the 13th movie. That's the problem with the movie. It doesn't feel like a Friday the 13th. I'm okay with them wanting to do something different. They've been trying to do different stuff with Jason ever since the sixth movie. They made him into a super zombie in part six. They fucking, uh, part seven, they fit him up against the telekinetic girl. In part eight, he goes to New York. So they've been doing different shit with the character in the last, like, four movies. I mean, or in this one. Well, the last three movies, and the, well, this one makes four, and they do new new stuff with him in X as well, and Freddy vs. Jason, so. They've been doing new, trying new stuff with the character for a while. The thing is, they always keep Jason as Jason. They never, like, change who he is. They always keep him, you know, as the guy in the hockey mask, the big, strong motherfucker that don't fuck around. They always keep him as Jason. I don't mind the movie going out of Crystal Lake, you know, taking him into, like, the town, like, like Crystal Lake, and both the... I don't mind them taking him into the fucking town, you know, that's around Crystal Lake. That's fine. But uh, once they change, like, the Jason being completely, it takes away from the feel of a Friday the 13th. It doesn't really feel as that much like a Friday the 13th. This film really feels more like an expo exploration of Jason and, like, how Jason is able to do the things he does, which is an interesting idea. But you find out that Jason's able to body hop. I'm fine with them, like, exploring Jason, like, how he's able to do the things he does, but give me something better than body hopping, fuck. I mean, body hopping has been done to death in horror films. You got Shocker. You got so many movies with body hopping. I like Shocker, too, but you still got so many movies with body hopping. <laughs> the fucking hidden. Too many body hopping in horror films. So, give me something a little bit more clever than body hopping. But, uh, in the film, you find out that Jason's soul is actually, like, inside of his heart. And his heart is actually like uh, his true form and it's a uh, it's a demon it's like a little serpent demon and it's like his true form and that if you're gonna give me Jason's true form you know give me something cooler looking than like a little serpent worm I mean come on I don't mind you know wanting to explore Jason more and explain like who he is and how he's able to do the things he did how, how he's able to do the shit he does but give me something cooler looking for the true form of Jason than a fucking you know little serpent worm but uh, that's that's me um, so Jason's like a little serpent worm that houses his soul, his heart is, and he goes into the body of uh, the body of like the fucking coroner there who's doing the autopsy. So then he, you get really cool gore in this this film. This film has terrific gore. It's got some of the best kills of the franchise, some of the best gore. Uh, he kills this other guy that was there working with him. He fuck, well, he eats he eats the heart of Jason is what it is, and that's how he gets possessed by Jason's spirit. And a really decent scene where you get like the uh, really gory where he's eating the heart and like the Jason's power or whatever uh, comes from his dead body into him, so now he has Jason's you know abilities. I guess that's what it was. It's not really explained, but uh, so he kills the guy that was working with him, like fucking rams his head down on this uh, gurney, I believe, and stabs him in the back of the head with some probe. I think is what it is. That's a decent scene. You get some good gore, like the dude. You get to see like the dude's face mushed down in the gurney. It's cool looking. Um. So that was cool death, and then you got Kane Hodder actually playing one of the security guards, and every time somebody Jason possesses, or like walks by a mirror or something, you see like the reflection of the regular Jason body. That's kind of neat, I kind of like that. 
But uh, uh, you see Kane Hodder is one of the like the fucking security guards, like an FBI agent. And he's like, uh, so is Jason going to be walking around anytime soon, Doc? He wasn't up but a big old pussy anyway. <laughs> I thought that was funny. I liked that humor. That was cool. And then it shows like it skips to like the news broadcast and both the security guards are dead. <laughs> Kane Hodder was killed by Jason. I thought that was funny. That was that was that was neat. I like that. Um, and then you got a new character here play who's Diana and she works in this fucking restaurant. Now you find out in this film that Jason has a half sister. Okay, the first film Mrs. Voorhees said that said that uh, Diana uh, well she said that Jason was her only child. Okay, in the first film, the original film. In this film, you find out Jason has like a half sister, I guess, from his father's side of the family, maybe. But on the new Friday Thirteenth documentary, Crystal Lake Memories, the director actually said that that uh she had had Diana like out of wedlock, and Jason was the only child that she claimed she fixated on him. So I guess that's the actual real reason, but it's never explained in the movie why he didn't just leave that one line of dialogue in the movie where it could have explained it. I don't know. So it comes up like. So it just comes out of nowhere and feels like they're just trying to like add more to Jason, like out of nothing. So I mean, I don't mind them adding more to the character. If they want to add him, had him in a, I don't know, a sister, a half sister, or whatever, that's great. But you know, fucking explain it. But uh, so he's got a sister in the film, which uh, I'm fine with that, other than the fact that it doesn't explain it at all. <clears throat> so she, he's got a sister in the film. Uh, you find out Jason needs to fucking, like, possess someone who is a Voorhees, take over their body, and he'll be reborn into his original Voorhees body. Okay, I'm with you so far here. <laughs> so, Jason obviously is going to have to go after Diana, his, you know, sister. So, he, uh, he goes to, like, well, you get a campground scene here where Jason, like, makes his way back to Crystal Lake. One thing I find funny is you're Jason's sister, and you know, like, that know what Jason can do and that he can possess people and everything, why the fuck would you still live in the same fucking town, you know, where Jason is, like, killing people in Crystal Lake, I don't get that, there's no fucking way I would stay there, but whatever, <laughs> so, but, um, but, uh, Jason wants to, of course, get to her so he can get a new body, so he stops at Camp Crystal Lake in the film and actually kills some campers there, uh, we get a long sex scene here, probably one of the longest in the franchise, Jason kills one girl by slicing at her, but the camera's like real shaky and the kill comes off kind of shitty looking because you can't even see what the fuck's going on. He kills uh, another girl in a funny scene where they like throw the condom out of the tent while they're fucking and Jason steps on the condom and he stabs her in the back and he fucking stabs her in the back with his big pole and rips it completely up like that and rips all the way through her and the effects look really cool. I love that kill. That was awesome. And then uh, I guess the, the guy gets killed off screen. That was cool. I like that. Um... But the Crystal Lake thing, like with him killing campers or whatever, kind of feels like thrown into the movie because the whole movie feels kind of like more like an exploration of one of Jason's abilities or who he is. So with the camper scene, it kind of feels like it's put in there just for the sake of the fans, which I like the scenes. Well, that's there, but it just feels unnecessary. But um, so he kills those, and then uh, you get a scene where Diana is like at the diner where she works, and you know Jason's like uh, he's there, he's watching them. Still in the, the doctor's body or the coroner's body who was performing the autopsy on his remains. And he's there and watching her and he can just attack her, you know, but it seems like he's taking his time for some reason. And then this cop shows up, him and his woman does, and he squishes the woman's head and gets, he uses the door to squish her head, like hits the door and it hits her head and squishes it, crushes her skull, I guess. And he just kidnaps the cop, but Diana was right there at the diner. Why in the fuck did he just get her right there? I don't know. I guess he needed a new body really quick because it says that the bodies he gets in gets weak over time and he has to switch. So, But she was right there. I mean, why not just go for it? But whatever, and you get a really weird scene here where he's like got the cop tied down. He like fucking shaves his face, shaves his mustache, and then transfers his... He transfers his soul into the fucking cop, and I'm like, okay, why did he shave him? I don't get that. It's creepy. I mean, the director said it's only in there because it's creepy, so it's a creepy scene. I don't mind the scene, but, I mean, what the fuck is the point? You can't just have a scene that's creepy just for no reason. I mean, there has to be some kind of re logical reason for this shit in this universe, but there's not. But at the same time, I don't hate the scene. So he's getting the cop now, and then as the cop, he attacks Diana at her home. She blows his brains out. He she falls down, and she can walk across him, but there's plenty of room on the other side. So, but she instead she chooses to walk to the side that's closer to him, which is like a really bad horror movie cliche. So she starts walking towards him. He gets up. He like grabs her and gets her on the ground. He starts trying to transfer his soul into her, his little demon worm self into her, so he can be reborn. Uh, John D. LeMay shows up. She told him to meet her there so she could tell him like what was going on and how he could get back together with Jessica, which is her daughter. 
and uh, she had well, her and Stephen had a baby uh, named Stephanie. And so he wants to get back together with her, and he's there to meet Diana, and he fucking uh, runs in there and just jumps the cop. <laughs> they get into a little struggle. Uh, he throws Stephen down. He grabs his sharpener and slings it and stabs uh, Diana in the back. So pretty decent scene here. Diana's dead. Uh, and then uh, he gets ready to kill Stephen, but Stephen, like, ducks out of the way, and he, like, sees his reflection in the mirror and sees his... And, like, the person is, like, looking and seeing the reflection of Jason, so it's kind of like the body is confused or the mind of the body is confused because it sees a different reflection than itself. It's kind of like a personal moment for Jason, I guess. <laughs> but uh, that was funny. Uh, and then he then, uh, Steven stabs him in the back with a poker. He goes flying out the window. Entertaining scene. Decent here. Um, Steven's a really likable guy. He wants to get back together with his woman who he abandoned because he wasn't ready to be a father yet, I guess. But now he wants to get back together with her and he wants to raise the kid. And uh, he tries really hard to get her trust back in him in the movie. But um, anyway, so the cop shows up. The cop is the sheriff of the town. He was like dating Diana. And you got a funny scene earlier in the film with Stephen Williams where he's like in the diner trying to get a, get Diana to help him take down Jason. The, the sheriff walks over there and the sheriff is dating her. So he's like, what's the problem here? And he goes, why don't you blow me, chief, right after your girlfriend gets through. He's like, that's my lady you're talking to. And. Stephen Williams goes, she's only your lady because she ain't had a taste of the Duke yet. I love that to this day. I love that. I love the character of Duke. I wish he didn't die. I wish he was the lead, to be honest. I love John D. LeMay, but if Duke would have been the lead, this film would have been really cool, to be honest. But um, I'm still, it's still cool that he's in the film, though. I enjoy him, and I would have, I would have liked to have seen him in more films, to be honest. But anyway, so well, back to where I was, Stephen... You know, they think he killed her. The sheriff shows up there. He thinks that uh, thinks that Stephen killed her. So they they take Stephen to the to, to jail, basically. He's in jail. One of the cops there is his friend who happens to be actually the director's brother. The sheriff had showed up there because Diana was talking to her daughter on the phone. And her daughter had phoned the sheriff when she uh, when the when Diana had hung up on her on the other end because she was being attacked by the cop who was possessed by Jason. I think the cop's name was Josh. The character's name was Josh. But anyway... So he's arrested, and they think he's the one that did it. Uh, Jessica has a new boyfriend. Her new man is this guy named Robert. The character's name is Robert. I think the actor's name is Stephen Culp, I believe. Give me a second here. Yep, Stephen Culp. I was right. <laughs> so yeah, it's Stephen Culp. I like this guy. Uh, he does good in the film, especially when he gets possessed by Jason. He's entertaining. You get a funny scene here. I love this scene in the movie where you got Stephen and Creighton Duke in the fucking jail cell. Or Creighton Duke is like giving him all the information about what to do and how to beat Jason. And for every answer he wants, he has to like break some of his fingers. That was entertaining. That was cool. I really like that. Once again, the Duke character is awesome. And John DeLamay is cool. But uh, so John DeLamay escapes from jail. Uh, he tries to go to the Voorhees house so he can find proof to, uh, to get Jessica to believe him and help him. Um, so he's there at the Voorhees house. He's trying to find proof. He finds the fucking Necronomicon. So you kind of get a hint that Jason was brought back to life in the Necronomicon. That's how he has all these demonic powers, which is kind of cool. I'm okay with that. That's kind of neat, bridging all the universes together like that. I mean, fuck it. They bridge Freddy and Jason together in Freddy versus Jason. Why not bring an evil dead? But uh, <laughs> that was cool. I like that. And then uh, Robert shows up there. Stephen hides. Robert gets attacked by Josh. Josh possesses uh, Robert's body. You get to see what happens to the bodies after Jason leaves them. Uh, Josh's body fucking like melts and his jaw gets stuck to the floor. A really cool gore scene and he kind of like, it's like the body pulls itself up and like the jaw detaches. That was cool. Really cool melting gore scene right there. The special effects are good. But once again, it doesn't feel like a Jason movie. So, uh, um, so now he's in Robert's body. Robert gets up. He decides, of course, to go after Jessica. Stephen has to go try to save her. He tries to attack Jessica. Stephen shows up, punches him in the face with a falcon punch. <laughs> Knocks Robert down. Um, takes off out of there with Jessica, they get in the car, they, uh, fucking, he's, he tries to get Steven, rams his fist, like, straight through the fucking window, and tries to grab Steven, John DeLamay fucking flattens him with the vehicle, like, hits him, runs him over once, and he, like, goes over top of the vehicle, and then he fucking hits him again, and he, he runs him over, like, underneath the vehicle on the way out, that was cool, I like that, uh, Jessica, of course, doesn't believe him, like, hits him in the nuts, I think, throws him out of the vehicle, and she takes off to the sheriff's station, they send, uh, John DeLamay's friend out there, named Randy, I believe is the character's name, he goes out there to pick him up, they get into a little fight, it's kind of silly, you don't really need it, but, uh, the, so they take, uh, Stephen to, <clears throat> to the, to the fucking police station, I don't know why, <laughs> had trouble saying that word there, I was gonna, 
I was going to point out the fact that he wants to go there, though, because uh, Randy tells him that Jessica is there. So that's where he decides to go, so he lets him take him in. So he's taken him to the police station. Of course, Robert shows up there possessed by Jason. You get a cameo by the director where the director's like, stop, where he's like trying to stop the evil. And fucking Robert, like, uh, well, I'm not going to call him Robert because it's Jason. Jason slings him over the fucking, like, desk, which was funny. He comes in there and knocks one chick out and just, like, from the side, you just see him. He just, like, casually hits her and her head hits the wall and you see a blood spot. I'm like, okay, decent. Okay, just kind of thrown in there, kill. But then the, the sheriff runs out there and he fucking hits him right in the face with a, <laughs> a fucking, uh, cool ass hit and uh, breaks his nose like lodges his like uh, brain up to his head or <laughs> or uh, you know br well he breaks his fucking nose well that's what I'm trying to say that's a really cool hit and it's like got blood all over his face and everything and that was pretty cool I like the take down of the sheriff that was cool like knocks his brain up into like knocks his nose up into his brain is what I was trying to say that was cool I like that and then like uh, he's chasing after Jessica and fucking, you know, Stephen and Randy show up there, and Stephen does a really badass thing where he fucking, like, swings the cuff underneath his, the cuffs underneath his legs, and he grabs uh, Randy's gun and fucking opens the, goes to town on uh, Jason and shoots him in the head, takes him down. So, uh, <clears throat> Stephen and Jessica, they get out of there, they head to the diner. Um, yeah, Jason is laying there, these two cops are, like, checking on him, he grabs them both and fucking goes, bam, hits their heads together in a really cool gore scene. I enjoyed that once again. Duke escapes from jail. So he's out. He manages to make it up there somehow and get the baby first before Stephen and Jessica get there. I don't know how, but he does. So he gets the baby and takes it to the Voorhees house. Stephen and Jessica are there at the diner. You get this loudmouth character in there named Joey B who's fucking annoying as shit and she just won't stop cussing 24-7. But she's annoying as fuck. She just won't shut the hell up. And uh, you get Jason kills this one guy at the diner and like slings him up against the diner door. And then he gets in there and grabs this one dude by the head and fucking rams him down like that. That was cool. Um, this other guy, well, no, the, he grabs this one dude there who's the cook and fucking drags him in some hot water, and he, like, raises back, like, at elbows the loud mouth the chick in the face and fucking knocks her mouth, like, inside words, like, inside out like that. Uh, that was cool. Um, so then he's after, then he's after Steven and Jessica still trying to, well, he tries to he tries to grab Jessica, and then this waitress that's there, he's real good friends with Jessica, and the character's name is Allison. I like this, I believe it's Allison, I like this woman, well, this actress, she's cool, she's fine. She fucking, like, shoots, like, a shotgun at him, blows a little chunk of his face off, stabs him in the chest with poker, and then he grabs her and stabs her under the poker. That was cool, and then he squishes her skull, and fucking brain matter flies, like, all the way at the ceiling. Like I said, this, whatever this movie has in it for faults, for story-wise and continuity-wise, it makes up for for it with gore. The gore in this film and the kills are fucking awesome. So she's dead and then the, the body just like falls over. Jason just like falls over because the body can't take no more. I like that. That was entertaining as fuck. That was funny. Uh, so then Jessica decides to run off and go to the Voorhees house on her own because she reads a note that Duke left her and that's how she that's where she, that's how she knows that's where the baby is or her baby is, Stephanie. So she heads there and she kind of just leaves Steven there and I'm like, what a douchebag. You know, he could have helped but whatever. So she goes there. She's there with uh, uh, Duke and he fight. this is when he gives her the magical dagger which he explains that only through a Voorhees can he be killed but I'm pretty sure he was killed in all the other movies too. He just kept coming back to life. I guess it's only through a Voorhees can he stay dead but they don't really explain it. But, uh, they don't really explain why, why only the magic dagger can do it but whatever. I mean, <laughs> It's like they're just pulling things out of their ass, but whatever. And then you get the, the sheriff shows up there. He's still alive, and she stabs him on accident, thinking he's Jason. And then Randy shows up there, and you find out Randy's really the one that's possessed. And Jason actually speaks inside Randy's body, which I thought was weird. I mean, why the fuck would Jason speak? But I guess there's no other way they could do the scene to make you not know which one is Jason, you know. But, uh, so he starts trying to get the baby. Fucking Steven comes in there with a machete, slices Randy's throat, or slices Jason's throat. I mean, he falls down, and, like, the little demon seed Jason crawls out of his neck, which was decent effects there. And so you get the true form of Jason here, and it's like this little serpent demon thing, and I'm like, well, it's lame. And there's a deleted scene where it grows the full size. It's like this big size uh, serpent demon. That would have been much cooler. I would have liked that much better. That should have been in the movie. But as you get it, it's just like a little serpent worm demon. And I'm like, that's fucking lame. Give me the, that's the true form of Jason. Give me the regular form he uses any day. But anyway. 
So it makes it down into the fucking like um, cellar of the Voorhees house. Oh, and Duke like falls down this conveniently placed trap door and gets like his leg, like gets like objects stabbed through his leg. And I'm like, uh, what the fuck? That <laughs> conveniently placed trap door in the Voorhees house is so stupid. But a uh, little serpent demon is down there. He finds his Diana's dead body because Jason can be reborn through even a dead Voorhees' body. So he goes into his sister's vagina, which is kind of weird. Fucking comes back uh, alive through her. So now he's back with a full body and everything, and he's like, gets to see Kane Hodder. This is a really cool entrance for Jason. He fucking just like leaps all the way through the basement floor and just busts all the way up through it, and it's so fucking awesome. It's so cool. That entrance is just like badass, man. Fucking A on that one, boys. I love that entrance. But he's there, and then Duke like handcuffs his hand to his hand or something like that, and he's trying to like hold him off from getting Steven and Jessica and the baby. And he's like, son of a bitch, you remember me? And I'm like, well, how the fuck does he remember you? Where the fuck were you during the other eight movies? But during the other eight films, I mean, it's cool that he has, you know, like a past with him. But give me some kind of answer. Once again, there was deleted dialogue here that explained it, that uh, he had killed Duke's girlfriend, you know, in the past at some point. But, you know, there's no explanation for it. They don't explain it in the movie. They don't. They should have left that dialogue in there. I don't give a fuck if it drugged down the movie or not. It would have inadvertently helped the movie. But whatever. Um, I mean, just because it drug it down, it still would have helped the movie because it would have explained more for this character that most people liked. Most Friday 13th fans liked this character. And it would have helped this character make more fucking sense. But no, we don't get that. But uh, he breaks Duke's back in a bear hug. He goes out like a badass, much cooler than the way Rob went out. In the, or he, he goes out like a badass, much better than the way Rob went out like a pansy in part four. So I like that better. So, Duke is dead, and then you get a cool scene where John DeLamay has just had enough of this shit, and he's like, get away from them, motherfucker, and just knocks him like right through this glass. They both fall through it, and it's really cool, and they get in the fight. Now, this fight here, uh, John DeLamay has broke fingers, and the fight goes on a little bit too long, but I guess it's where Jason is pissed off at John DeLamay because he's, like, tired of him, like, stopping him through the whole movie. But at the same time, it's Jason's entire existence that's at stake here, and the fight kind of goes on just a little bit too long. Um, but, uh, he hits Jason with a rake, starts beating Jason in the head with a shovel. Jason grabs the shovel, actually hits him in the face with it, slings him down, almost hits his head on a rock, and then grabs him, slings him into the top of a fucking jungle gym, and then lifts up the jungle gym and tosses it over, and turns it over. That was fun. I like that. I still like the little fight, though, but it goes on too long. Uh, Jason should, I mean, his, his entire existence is at stake here. He should, once he gets him out of the jungle gym, he should have killed him right then and there, just hit him one time to obliterate him. But you don't get that. Instead, Jessica shows up from behind, saves him, stabs him into the heart with a magical dagger, which is entertaining here. Magical dagger in a Jason movie seems kind of a little, little bit too supernatural, and it is, but it's still decently entertaining. The death for Jason you get here, <clears throat> Jason being drugged into hell, is really cool. This ending is much better than Jason Takes Manhattan and Part 7. A bunch of demon hands come up out of the ground and fucking start dragging Jason into hell, which is pretty cool. But uh, and he like, grabs a hold of John DeLamay, and it takes Jessica like a second to go to save him and I'm like what the fuck's your problem after everything he's done for you through this whole movie you're gonna pussy out now and not do anything to help him so I was kind of like what but uh she decides to start helping him and she tries to pull him out of there and she manages to like get him loose and the hands take Jason down to hell all right so you got Jessica you got Steven and you got you know baby Stephanie they're all fine it's you know sunrise and they're all walking off into the sunrise and they're happy to be together they're a family now so everything's fine for those characters and then you get the coolest, the coolest ending shot in a film period. This would have made an awesome after credit scene for a film. I mean, for this film. This would have made an awesome after credit scene. This scene fucking rules. Uh, you get, everybody, everybody knows what the scene is by now, but it's still fucking cool even watching it today. You get Jason's hockey mask there laying in the dirt. It's the only thing left that didn't make it, that, that, didn't, that didn't get drugged to hell. And uh, you get fucking like a close up on it. The camera pans down to it. You get Freddy Krueger's arm popping up out of the ground and fucking grabbing it and pulling it in, in the hell with like, you know, a Freddy Krueger style laugh. The hand was actually Kane Hodder's hand though, but it's still fucking cool. But seeing Freddy Krueger cameo at the end of a Jason film is just fucking awesome. I love that. That right there automatically gives this film a badass ending. Rating for this film, I'd give it three stars out of possible four. It's not a bad movie. It just doesn't feel that much like a Friday the 13th film. There's still like Friday the 13th stuff in it and it still feels slightly like a Jason movie, but not 
not more like a Friday the Thirteenth movie, but not completely. It's like feels more like an exploration of like who Jason, well, like what what Jason is and what he can do. And once you get to the point of that that kind of story in a film franchise where you demystify the character and just explain everything, the character always becomes less interesting. I mean, just inadvertently, but you have to do that eventually. So I'm fine with that happening. Just give me something better than him being a little satanic parasite demon worm. If you're going to show me the true version of Jason, give me something cooler looking like the big demon was in the deleted scene that sadly was deleted, so that pissed me off right there even more. But as it is, it's a three-star film. I enjoy the film. I like the film. It's not a horrible movie. It's better than Jason Takes Manhattan, and it's better than Part 5. But it's not a great movie by any means, and it's uh, nowhere near as good as Part 1 or or Part uh, or Part 2 um, or Part 4. It's better than part five. It's better than part eight. I don't like it better than part six. It's about even with part seven. Um, it's a little bit better than part three, only because the ending of part three makes no sense whatsoever. Then this one's a little bit more entertaining, but um, just because of the the extra gore and everything, it's a little bit more entertaining. And the ending of part three makes no fucking sense. But I like the setting and everything and the style of Part 3 way better than this one. It's just that the ending of this one is what amps it up to being slightly better than Part 3. Because the ending of this one uh, is just way cooler than the ending of Part 3, which makes no fucking sense. But uh, anyway, and I do like it better than Jason X. I'll go ahead and tell you right there. It's better than Jason X. So I'll see you guys again with Friday the 13th. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I should, see. I should say I'll see you guys again with Jason X, which is Friday the 13th Part 10. I'll see you guys again with Jason in Space, baby.